All right, guys, welcome to your fourth video lecture. This one is going to be over two important theorems that you're going to learn this year in calculus. You're going to learn five theorems overall, but the goal of this lecture is to introduce you to two of them. Okay, the first one is called the Intermediate Value Theorem, and I'm not going to read the theorem to you word for word. I'll let you do that kind of on your own, but I want to just kind of give you the main idea of what the Intermediate Value Theorem is saying. So here is a basic example that kind of illustrates the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so let's say that in the morning you wake up at 8 a.m. And when you wake up, it is 62 degrees. Now, I don't know if that's going to happen necessarily during the summer. I hope it does, but I really don't really think so. But uh, hopefully it does. And so let's just say 8 a.m., you wake up 62 degrees. Let's say that currently, which right now it's 941 a.m. according to my iPad there. Let's say that at 9.41 a.m. the temperature had increased up to 71 degrees. What the intermediate value theorem is saying is that at some point in between 8 o'clock when you woke up and 9.41, which is the time right now, it had to have been 67 degrees at some point. It also had to be 68 degrees, it also had to be 69 degrees, and it had to be every temperature in between 62 degrees and 71 degrees. And the reason for that, the main reason for that, is because temperature is a continuous function. Okay, so because temperature is continuous, it can't just jump around temperatures. You can't just go from 50 degrees one second to the next second 75 degrees. It had to go through every single uh, degree in between uh, whatever your two end point degrees are. Okay, so that's kind of the basic idea of the theorem, and now I'm going to show you kind of how to use it to answer a problem. Okay, so the main hypothesis of the intermediate value theorem is that the function is continuous. So anytime a function is continuous, that is when we can use the intermediate value theorem. Okay, so example one, train A runs back and forth on an east-west section of railroad track. Its velocity, which is measured in meters per minute, is given by a differentiable function v sub a of t. Now the reason I highlight differentiable function is because what I need you to know about this word differentiable is that anytime you see that it means that the function is also continuous and we'll talk more about that during the school year but for right now you need to know if a function is differentiable that implies automatically that it is continuous. Okay so we continue reading the question. It says, do the data in the table support the conclusion that train A's velocity, and remember that's the function that we were given, is negative 100 meters per minute at some time t with 5 less than t less than 8? Give a reason for your answer. Okay, well they gave me an interval here to consider. So if I look at this table, the time values between 5 and 8 is this interval right here. And so the question is, does the velocity of train A have to equal negative 100 meters per minute at some time in that interval? Well, if you think about it, negative 100 is in between 40 and negative 120, and we already said that this uh, velocity function is continuous because it was differentiable. So the answer to our question is yes. And so what we're going to say when we answer this question is, first of all, we're going to say yes, because we have to state the hypothesis of the intermediate value theorem. So we're going to say because V A of T is continuous, and the reason that we knew it was continuous is because the, fun uh, the original problem said that it was differentiable, which implies continuity. Because V A sub T is continuous and negative 120 is less than negative 100, which is less than 40. So that's me basically saying that the value that you want the velocity to be equal to, negative 100, is in between the two given velocity values at the endpoints of that interval. Then what we say is by the IVT, and it's okay for us to abbreviate the IVT, there exists 
a time t. Now the only kind of tedious part of these problems is that they do kind of take a little bit of time to write out the answer. So there exists a time t on the interval from 5 to 8 such that v sub a of t is equal to negative 100. That is a well-constructed sentence that answers the question talks about the hypothesis of the intermediate value theorem, which is this part right here and also this part right here. Those are the two things that you need for the hypothesis of the theorem. And then basically what I do after I state the hypothesis is I really just kind of uh, restate the question by saying there exists a time t, 5 less than t less than 8, such that v, of a, v sub a of t is equal to negative 100. Okay, so example two, again, uh, just using the intermediate value theorem, it says a car travels on a straight track during the time interval from zero to 60. The car's velocity is a continuous function. So I want to make sure that I recognize I am dealing with a continuous function, and that means that the IVT applies. For zero less than t less than 60, must there be a time? That is a very important phrase right there, must there be a time? I want you to get into the habit, anytime you see that phrase, you need to think about using either the intermediate value theorem or the mean value theorem, which we'll learn here in just a second. So must there be a time t when the velocity is equal to negative 5? So what I do is I scan my table and I see is negative 5 in between any of the velocity values given on the table? Okay, well, if I search through here, from 0 to 15 on the t-axis, the velocity goes from negative 20 to negative 30. Well, negative 5 is not in between those. So I know that there doesn't necessarily have to be a time when the velocity is equal to negative 5 on that interval. Now, could there be? Yes, because we don't have all of the information on the table, but there doesn't have to be based on the information that is given. Okay, I continue searching from negative 30 to negative 20, no. From negative 20 to negative 14, no. Negative 5 is not in between those. From negative 14 to negative 10, no. From negative 10 to 0, this is kind of the first opportunity I see for the velocity to equal to negative 5. Okay, so there is one instance. And then there's also another instance here, or is there? No, there's not another instance between 0 and 10. Negative 5 is not between those, and so the only instance is going to be this interval right here where the velocity had to equal negative 5. Okay, so we are going to answer the question here by saying yes, since v of t is continuous, and that was given in the uh, problem, it said that v of t was a continuous function, and negative 10 is less than negative 5, which is less than 0. So that's me saying that the velocity that you want me to prove, negative 5, is in between two of the given velocities, negative 10 and 0. Make sure that you state the theorem. So by the IVT, there must be a time. Okay, and they call it T, so we'll call it T as well. And that t is going to be between 35 and 50, because if you look back at the table, 35 and 50 were the t values for that particular subinterval. So between 35 and 50, such that v of t is equal to negative 5. Okay, that is a perfectly well-justified answer and uh, has everything that you need in there. So when you get to the assignment, make sure that you model after me how to justify your answer using the IVT. Okay, the second theorem that we're going to talk about is the mean value theorem, and there is a reason that it is called the mean value that we'll talk about here in just a second. This is a really incredible theorem that basically says this, so I'll put it into sort of a physical application for you. What the theorem says is pretty much this. Let's say that you went 150 miles in two hours. Okay, well, what that means is that you basically averaged 75 miles per hour. What the mean value theorem says is that if you average 75 miles per hour over a trip, 
that at some point, at some time on your trip, you had to be going exactly 75 miles per hour, at least once. And that's what the mean value theorem is basically saying. So I want to kind of point out a couple of things in this theorem. It says that F is continuous on the closed interval from A to B. It is differentiable on the open interval from A to B. So those are the two things required in order for the mean value theorem to apply. And in that case, there exists a number C in the interval from A to B such that F prime of C, well, we've seen this symbol before. F prime of C is what is called the derivative. And in this case, we want to think about it as being the instantaneous rate of change. Okay, so F prime of C is your instantaneous rate of change. This is the rate of change in a function at an instant, at a particular moment, and that moment is called C. And that is equal to F of B minus F of A over B minus A. This fraction right here is called the average rate of change. So I'm going to write that down. It is the average rate of change. And so what this theorem is saying is that if the function is continuous on the closed interval, and differentiable on the open interval, then there had to be at least one point where the instantaneous rate of change or the derivative is equal to the average rate of change, f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Okay, so let's now use this theorem to see if we can answer some questions. Okay, so we have example three here. Hot water is dripping through a coffee maker. The amount of coffee in the cup at time t is given by a differentiable function, c. And remember we said just a second ago on the other page that if a function is differentiable, that means that it is also continuous. So I'm going to write that down by annotating that word differentiable. Okay, selected values of c of t measured in ounces are given in the table above. Is there a time t... Okay, again, so there is that phrase that we talked about before. Is there a time t? Anytime you hear that, you need to think either IVT or MVT. Is there a time t on this interval from 2 to 4 at which C prime of t is equal to 2? Well, notice that in this problem, I'm given C of t, not C prime of t. So anytime the question is asking you to prove something about the derivative, that's when you need to think, MVT. Okay, so that's kind of what makes these questions a tad bit difficult in calculus is that you have all of these theorems at your disposal, but you've got to figure out which one you're supposed to use. Since we are given C of T and asked to prove something about C prime of T, that's how we know we're going to use the mean value theorem. Well, so what does the mean value theorem say? It says that the function has to be continuous and differentiable. And that's certainly true in this case, since the problem told us that. And that if those things are true, that the derivative, which in this case is denoted by C prime of T, is going to equal the average rate of change over the given interval. Okay, so the given interval is right here from 2 to 4. What I want to do first is I want to calculate the average rate of change over that interval. So the average rate of change, sorry about that, I messed up a little bit, I'm going to rewrite that, is going to be C of 4 minus C of 2 divided by 4 minus 2. And the place that I'm going to find the C of 4 and the C of 2 values is from the table. So C of 2 is going to be right here, C of 4 is going to be right there. So C of 4 is going to be 12.8. And C of 2 is going to be 8.8. .8, and I'm going to divide that by 2. And 12.8 minus 8.8 .8 is 4 divided by 2, which is equal to 2. And so since the average rate of change was equal to 2, and this function is continuous and differentiable, I know that the instantaneous rate of change, which is given by the derivative, this guy right here, has to also equal to 2 for some time t in the interval from 2 to 4. So everything that I basically just said out loud to you, I'm now going to write on the paper. So I'm going to say since this function, c of t, is continuous 
and also differentiable, there exists time t, or you could just say t if you wanted to, for t less than or equal to t less than or equal to 4, such that, and then I'm basically just going to redo the calculation that I just did. c prime of t is equal to c of 4 minus c of 2 over 4 minus 2, which we already calculated was equal to 2. Okay, so this is how I'm going to justify my answer. When you guys work problems on the assignment, you need to try to model this as best you can. And if you have questions, then please feel free to let me know. Okay, example four, let f be the function given by f of x is equal to x cubed plus 5x. This question is asking what value of c is guaranteed by the mean value theorem. Okay, well, I know that the mean value theorem says that f prime of c is equal to f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Well, the question is, what are a and b? Well, remember, those are the numbers that are the interval that you're talking about. So the interval that we're talking about here is 1 and 3. So my 1 is going to be a, and my 3 is going to be b. So the first thing I'm going to calculate is, what is the average rate of change? OK, well, the average rate of change is going to be f of 3 minus f of 1 divided by 3 minus 1. So the question is, how do I find f of 3 and f of 1? Well, the function is given to me right here. So I just need to substitute in 3 and 1 into the function so that I can get the value. OK, well, if I substitute in 3, I'm going to have 3 cubed, which is 27, plus 5 times 3, which is 15, and 27 plus 15 is 42 minus f of 1, 1 cubed is 1, plus 5 times 1 is 5, and 1 plus 5 is 6, divided by 3 minus 1. If I do the arithmetic there, I'm going to get 36 divided by 2, which I know is 18. So that is the average rate of change, 18. The next thing I need to find is the derivative, because I know that the derivative is going to equal to the average rate of change. So f prime of x is going to be 3x squared plus 5. Okay, so there is my derivative. Okay, so now I'm going to use the conclusion of the mean value theorem, which I put right over here, in order to find out what c is. So f prime of c is going to be 3c squared plus 5, and that's going to equal to the average rate of change, which was 18. Okay, if I now use algebra to solve this equation, I'm going to subtract 5 on both sides. That's going to give me 3c squared is equal to 13. And then divide by 3 on both sides to get c squared is equal to 13 divided by 3. And then the last thing I need to do is take the square root of both sides. Now, a lot of you are going to tell me and correctly tell me that whenever I take the square root, I need plus or minus the square root of 13 over 3. But in this case, we're only going to take the positive square root of 13 over 3 because if you look back at the interval that was given to us, negative square root of 13 over 3 is not on that interval, and so that is not necessarily guaranteed by the mean value theorem. So my final answer is just going to be c is equal to the square root of 13 over 3. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. There is a problem very similar to that on your assignment, so please let me know if you need help or have any questions. Okay, last example here, we have f as a twice differentiable function. So really what that means, we talked about what differentiable implies. If a function is twice differentiable, then that means that both f and f prime are continuous functions. Okay, we are given that f of 2 is equal to 5, and f of 5 is equal to 2, and g is the function given by f of f of x. So that's not f times f, it is f of f of x. Okay, so part A, explain why there must be a value. That is the key phrase right there that you're looking for uh, to determine, okay, I'm probably going to use a theorem here, either the IVT or the MVT. Okay, well in this case, 
we're going to use the MVT. And the reason for that is because we're asked to prove something about the derivative of the function we're given. So we are given information about f. We are asked to prove that f prime of c is equal to negative 1. So I know that the mean value theorem says something about the instantaneous rate of change equaling the average rate of change. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these two points that were given to me in order to compute the average rate of change. Okay, so the average rate of change is going to be f of 5 minus f of 2 divided by 5 minus 2. f of 5 is 2, says the problem, and then f of 2 is 5 divided by 5 minus 2. This is going to be negative 3 divided by 3, which is negative 1, which is exactly what I wanted it to be because that's what I'm trying to prove. Okay, so what I'm going to say now is since f is continuous, and I can abbreviate continuous and differentiable by the MVT, there exists time t, and that t is in the interval from, well, they, they used the notation c, didn't they? Yeah, so if you look at the problem, they're using uh, c, and so that's probably what I need to do as well. So I'm going to erase the t there and put c instead. So there exists a time c, 2 less than c less than 5, such that f prime of c is equal to f of 5 minus f of 2 over 5 minus 2, which we just calculated is equal to negative 1. Okay, so make sure that you are writing all of this. I actually can't remember if I um, named the theorem on the last problem on the previous page, but make sure that you name the theorem that you're using. In this case, we're using the MVT. Okay, part B of this question says show that g prime of 2 is equal to g prime of 5. Well, probably the easiest way to do that is just to take the derivative, plug in 2, and then plug in 5, and then show that they're the same. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to say g prime of x, first of all. Well, remember, g of x was given by this function back up here, f of f of x. And so the derivative of that is going to involve the chain rule. So I'm going to have f prime of the inside function, which is going to be f of x, multiplied by the derivative of the inside function, which is f prime of x. Okay, so g prime of 2 now is going to equal f prime of f of 2 times f prime of 2, which is equal to f prime of 5 times f prime of 2. Well, I don't have any information about f prime of 5 or f prime of 2, so for right now, I'm just going to leave my answer like that. Okay, similarly, we're going to have g prime of 5, which is equal to f prime of f of 5 multiplied by f prime of 5. But remember, f of 5 was equal to 2, and so what we're going to have is we're going to have f prime of 2 times f prime of 5, and what you should now notice is that this and this are equivalent, and so what we've done is we've shown that g prime of 2 is equal to g prime of 5. Okay, the second part of this question says to use this to result to explain why there must be a value. Again, there's that phrase that we're looking for in order to know that we're using one of our two theorems. Okay, so in this case, we want to show that g double prime of k is equal to 0. So again, that is the derivative of something that we have information about. And so because of that, we're going to use the intermediate value theorem. Okay, or I'm sorry, the mean value theorem, because we're talking about the derivative. Okay, so what do we know? We know that since g is continuous and differentiable by the MVT, there exists, and now we look back and see what uh, notation did they use. They used k, so I'm going to write k for uh, 2 less than k less than 5. 
such that, and I'm going to abbreviate that because I'm uh, kind of out of space on that side of the paper, so ST is just an abbreviation for such that, G double prime of K is equal to G prime of 5 minus G prime of 2 divided by 5 minus 2. But what we just did is we showed that g prime of 5 is equal to g prime of 2. And so if those two things are equal, what do you think that numerator is going to? Well, if you answered 0, then you're correct. And so 0 divided by 3 is equal to 0. Okay, so that is a great way to justify your answer on that particular problem. Okay, part C, by the way, if, in case you didn't know this, this is a previous free response question on an old AP exam, so this is uh, something that you could expect possibly to wind up on your AP exam. And if that feels overwhelming right now, it's because it's the summer and you haven't actually taken the calculus course yet, and so you just need to practice more problems and get more comfortable with the information. And if you are feeling good about this, then feel good that you already know how to do something that is uh, possibly going to be on the AP exam. Okay, so part C says, let h of x equal to f of x minus x. Explain why there must be a value r such that h of r is equal to zero. Well, notice this time they're asking me to prove something about the function that I am given and not its derivative. So because of that, I'm going to use the IVT. Okay, so what I need to do is I need to actually calculate what is h of 2 and what is h of 5. Well, h of 2, by the definition of what h of x is, is equal to f of 2 minus 2. And remember way back up there that f of 2 was equal to 5 minus 2 is equal to 3. Okay, furthermore, h of 5 is going to be f of 5 minus 5. And remember that f of 5 was 2, and if I subtract 5, I'm getting negative 3. And so what I should notice now is that 0 lies in between 3 and negative 3. And so basically what I've done is I have shown why there must be an r such that h of r is equal to 0. I just need to explain my answer. So since h is continuous and negative 3 is less than 0, which is less than 3, by the IVT, there exists, and we're going to use the same notation that the problem used, r, for 2 less than r less than 5, such that h of r is equal to 0. Okay, so hopefully this video has given you enough practice in justifying your answers using the IVT and the MVT. And if you guys have any more questions, then please feel free to contact me. Talk to you all later.